Look up the word crazy in the dictionary and you might just find an asterisk beside the definition that says, listen to the Subiquitous podcast featuring Sue Duffield and you'll find out what crazy means. Sue's travelogue journey of unfiltered stories, impossible miracles, and faith-filled fun will be revisited right here. So buckle up and let's get going with this humorous travelogue of an unfiltered saint, Subiquitous. There's an amazing scene at the end of a 1996 movie called Marvin's Room. Bessie, played by Diane Keaton, who has cared for her ill father and her aunt for over 20 years, she learns that she has leukemia. And she receives a visit from her estranged sister, Lee, played by Meryl Streep. And Bessie tells Lee, I've been so lucky to have had so much love in my life. And Lee says yes, and her father and her aunt really do love her. Bessie seems to be taken back for a moment, and her sister doesn't understand. Bessie doesn't mean she's lucky to be loved. She means she's lucky to have had so much love to give to others. Lucky to love. Or maybe in the Christian world we'd say, blessed to have loved. What an amazing perspective. If we all are full of God's love, it will overflow to others. I received a note from a friend who writes, you know, life is so good, Sue, with God in the center. Now problems turn into solutions and fear turns into hope and anger turns into love. I'm free in God and it's the best place to be. I've learned to take risks and face challenges. I take no credit for any of this. To God be all the glory. He never let go. He took me from a bitter, unhappy, depressed alcoholic and gave me the wings of eagles, soaring to heights I never dreamed possible. He's given me his words to share with other alcoholics. He's restored my family, and he's filled me with his love each day. That testimony is wonderful in many respects not least because it perfectly illustrates what it means to have love overflowing in your life. Only God can do that. And he does it whenever he finds a willing heart. Romans chapter 12, 9 through 16 seems at first glance to be an unconnected series of staccato commands, you know, kind of like a rag bag of miscellaneous exhortations. But A closer examination reveals that these verses flesh out what love looks like in the Christian life. The theme of the passage isn't hard to find. Love must govern all our relationships. It's a recipe for love, and it seems to have 12 different ingredients. Number one, love must be sincere. In verse 9, it starts off with saying, let love be genuine. The word genuine means without hypocrisy. It's referred to an actor who played a a certain role on stage. It came to mean anyone who acts contrary to his own true feelings. And it applies to those who put forth the appearance of virtue that they don't really possess. You know, Eugene Peterson, the author of The Message, offers this paraphrase, love from the center of who you are and don't fake it. Number two, love has to be discerning. Abhor what is evil and hold fast to what is good in verse nine, part B. Love hates evil. Think about that for a second. Often we think of love as an ooey gooey emotion that causes us to lose our sense of right and wrong, but that's far from true in Christian love. We can't love evil and love God at the same time any more than we can love money and love God at the same time. Here's another way to put it. Don't ever get over being shocked by evil. (laughs) That's hard to do in a world where almost anything goes. Here's a good test. When was the last time you blushed? You know, in the olden days, we blushed when something risque appeared on television. We talked about that the other night. Now we hardly notice it or we, or even laugh at it sometimes. And if you've wasted your time watching the Grammys last week, <laughs> you know how awful some of that fiasco called music interpretation was and how demonically degrading it was to humanity and to believers in Christ everywhere. It really did sicken me. Alexander Pope, the 18th century 
English poet offered this warning. Vice is a monster of so frightful mien, as to be hated needs to be seen, yet seen too oft familiar with her face. We first endure, then pity, then embrace. Sometimes we say love is blind. God says, no, love needs clear vision. Our love needs discernment, or else we'll end up loving things we ought not to love and entering into relationships that are not good for us. And while love is supreme, it's never enough. Not every relationship is a good relationship. Not every choice is a good choice. Not every friendship is good for us. Not every job is a wise career move. Not every roommate is a healthy choice. Not every purchase is a wise use of our money. So there are really two parts to making wise choices. First of all, you have to know what is right. This is crucial because we live in a world where many people evidently have lost their mind and have lost all sense of right and wrong. Everything, everything appears to them as shades of gray. And second, you must have the courage to choose what you know to be right. I happened to catch a few minutes of a televised speech by Condoleezza Rice a few years ago. And during the question time, someone asked how she managed to deal with all the criticism that comes to anyone in a high-profile position, especially being African-American. She replied that the most important thing in life is to discover what you believe to be true and then to stand up for those beliefs no matter what. Way to go, Condoleezza. Then she said, if you do what you know is right, it doesn't matter what people think. And prejudice is someone else's problem, not mine. You know, true discernment gives you vision to see what is right and then the courage to choose to do it. So please take Paul's words to heart here. Never get over being shocked by evil. Glue yourself to what is good. Number three, love has to display tender affection. In verse 10 of Romans 12, love one another with brotherly or sisterly affection. Paul uses two words that speak of the love of family members for each other. One of them is a word you already know, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, they say. <laughs> it comes from two Greek words that have been joined together, phylos, which means tender affection, fondness, devotion, and adelphos, usually translated as brother but it literally means one born of the same womb. So the word Philadelphia literally means tender affection owed to those born from the same womb. So it's easy to understand why early Christians adopted this word to describe Christian love. All Christians have been born of the same womb through the new birth. Oh, Man, I have to say that again. All Christians have been born of the same womb through the new birth. Praise God. Everyone who was saved is saved in the same way. God doesn't have three different plans of salvation. One for Protestants, one for Catholics, and one for everyone else. Jesus said, you must be born again in John 3, 3. To be born again means to receive new life through personal faith in Jesus. It means to be born from God's womb. I only have one brother. His name is Dave. I'm the firstborn. We're very different. Dave lives in New Jersey. I live in Tennessee. We have different personalities, different habits, hobbies, different likes and dislikes. Yet one thing binds us together. We come from the same womb. That fact means that there is a special place in my heart for my brother, so that even if I haven't seen him for a long time, it's as if I just saw him yesterday. There's a bond between us that time and distance can't break. And that same truth applies in the spiritual realm. Everyone who belongs to Jesus belongs to me, 
and I owe all of them tender affection and brotherly and sisterly love. Let's be clear about this. We are to love all true believers everywhere all the time. And that's hard because most of us have some inner qualifications going on. We don't like this group. We don't like that denomination. Maybe we're not comfortable with people who pray in a unique prayer language or with those who use a prayer book. We may even distrust people who have different worship styles than we do. Maybe we have some preferences regarding skin color or ethnic background. Put simply, though, all such thinking is simply wrong and and has to be abandoned. God's kingdom is not limited to graduates of one seminary or members of one denomination or to people who look, think, and act just like us. God's kingdom embraces all true believers, no matter who they are or what church they happen to attend. Number four, love has to honor others. It says in verse 10 of Romans 12, outdo one another in showing honor. I love that. That Greek word actually has a sense of competition about it. So the translation, outdo one another, is very accurate. We live in a day where the opposite seems to be the case. We hear much about quotas, preferential treatment, affirmative action. And yet in the Christian context, it means that we take affirmative action to make sure that others receive preferential treatment before we do. And this obviously goes so much against our human nature that it's not possible without the infusion of God's Holy Spirit in our hearts. You know, I pretty much quit quoting presidents after Ronald Reagan. He did have one good one, though, and it was a saying that was on his desk in the Oval Office. There is no limit to how far you can go if you don't care who gets the credit. Wow. Paul would say a hearty amen to that one. Number five, love has to be enthusiastic. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit and serve the Lord. Some say that religious enthusiasm is often derided as nothing but excessive emotionalism and a sign of fanaticism. Yet the person we call a fanatic becomes a fan when he goes to the Super Bowl, if the Eagles win, and cheers themselves hoarse. (laughs) But Paul's words have nothing to do with how loud we sing or how much we clap or whether or not we raise our hands when we worship. Those things are purely secondary. Paul is really challenging us to put as much effort into our Christianity as we do into our work. The Amplified Bible catches the meaning very well. Never lag in zeal and in earnest endeavor. Be aglow and burning with the Spirit, serving the Lord. And we all say amen to that. The phrase be aglow and burning with the Spirit refers to a a boiling pot. Serve the Lord with zeal and with boiling intensity. The world will not be moved by half-hearted disciples who sort of serve the Lord. The story is told by a communist who said to a Christian acquaintance, If I believed what you believe, I would crawl over a field of broken glass to make sure everyone heard the good news. Living as we do in an age of terrorism and in an international instability, you know what? There's no time to waste. The king's business requires haste. Number six, love has to be patient. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, and be constant in prayer. You know, behind these three phrases lies the hope of our Lord's return. And while we wait for Jesus to return from heaven, we have to be patient in hard times, constantly praying and rejoicing in the hope of better days to come. Years ago, I attended a writer's conference at Wheaton College, where then-President V. Raymond Edmond greeted us during the opening session, and I'll never forget this. This is what he said. Writers, chin up and knees down. (laughs) Wow, that is great advice for all of us. Number seven, love must be generous. 
contribute to the needs of the saints, as in verse 13 of Romans 12. The word translated contribute is the verb form of the word koinonia. Talk about a word that has been massacred over the years. I heard a radio DJ once say koinonia. Well, however you want to say it. On one level, it means sharing in the hurts and heartaches of others. And on another level, it means opening up our pocketbook and giving so that the poor believers will have their needs met. Here is a true measure of your Christian faith. What are you doing to meet the needs of those who have less than you? We can extend this to supporting God's work around the world. Do you give off the top or off the bottom of your paycheck? Your answer says something important about the state of your soul. Number eight, love has to pursue hospitality. In verse 13 of Romans 12, seek to show hospitality. The Greek word for hospitality is philozenia. I think I pronounced that right. A compound made up of two or other Greek words, phylos, which means kind affection or love, and xenos, which means stranger or foreigner. So literally, philoxenia means one who loves strangers. Hospitality means showing kindness to strangers. This command shows up in all kinds of places in the New Testament because hospitality was a central mark of the early church. In the first century, They didn't have Holiday Inns or Hamptons or Hilton Hotels. When Paul came to Corinth, he couldn't check into the airport Marriott because it hadn't been built yet. (laughs) And the few ends that they did have were ill-kept and dangerous. Many were little more than brothels and havens for all kinds of stuff. And as Christians traveled from place to place across the empire, they didn't have the option of staying in a nice motel. The only way the Christian message could spread would be for other Christians to open their homes to others. A novel idea. The only way an evangelist from Antioch could make it in Ephesus would be for a family in Ephesus to open their home to him. The only way a teacher could visit Cyprus would be for someone from Cyprus to open his home and say, my brother, you are welcome to stay with me. I once spoke at a women's conference and did a workshop called What in the World is Confessions of a Xenophiliac? (laughs) You would believe the eyebrows that were raised. I began with a confession that there is no such word as a xenophiliac. I just made it up. And by switching around the word philoxenia, the actual Greek word for hospitality, but I like xenophiliac better because it sounded like it ought to be a word, and even if it's not. (laughs) Just before I gave my message that day, one of the staff members of the retreat said, Oh God, we thank you for Sue today, and we thank you for being the original xenophiliac. I laughed out loud. It sounded really funny to hear my own word come back in a prayer. And then in a flash it hit me. It's true. God is the original lover of strangers. For while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's in Romans 5, 8. And while we were estranged from God, he sent his son to the earth. And we who were once strangers and aliens on the earth have now been brought near to God by the blood of Jesus Christ. And you can read all about that in Ephesians chapter 2, 11 through 13. No, we're no longer strangers. We're not aliens. We're not orphans. And we're no longer far away from God. We are now as near to God as his own son is. And for through the blood of Jesus, we are brought into his family. Because he loves us. And he loved us when we were strangers. But we're not strangers anymore. That same thing happens today when we show hospitality to others. My goal, my prayer, and my hope. One day, the Duffields will have a house other than this 900-square-foot apartment, where I will show hospitality once again with people coming through Nashville. You watch me. It's going to happen. We are only doing for others what God did for us. Number nine, love has to be kind. 
Bless those who persecute you and bless and do not curse them. And there's two parts about this that we, I want to consider right now. Number one, what happens to us and how we respond? Number two, well, here's the truth. We will be persecuted. We will be hated, mistreated, misunderstood, lied about, gossiped about, and there will be those who go beyond this to hurt us deeply, leaving scars that last for a lifetime. And sometimes the attacks come from those that are closest to us, sometimes from within our own family, often from our circle of very close friends, and sometimes from people we thought were our best friends. There is no escaping this reality And to deny it is like denying the sun comes up in the east and sets in the west. Sooner or later, people we loved and trusted can let us down and some of them will turn on us. We can't predict how or when it will happen or who it will be, but it will happen. And what will we do then? How do you bless someone when you would rather curse them? Well, here's a simple way to do that. When faced with someone who has mistreated you, ask God to do for them what you want God to do for you. Seek the blessing for them that you want God to do for you. Think it of this way. The greater the hurt, the greater the potential blessing that will come when we bless those who curse us. Praise God for that. I have seen that happen in my own life. Remember, that your enemy is a gift from God to you. Though you don't know it and often can't see it, the person who has hurt you deeply can be a gift from God to you. To say that is not to excuse the evil or to condone the mistreatment. It's to say exactly what Joseph meant when he said to his brothers, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. In Genesis 50, verse 20. Enemies humble us. They keep us on our knees. They reveal our weaknesses and they expose our total need for God. And just as David needed King Saul to pursue him, to persecute him, and repeatedly attempt to kill him, we need the enemies God sends to us. If we didn't need them, he wouldn't send them. Therefore, though, we thank God who knows best and we love our enemies the best we can. Often God raises up an enemy to see if we really want to be like Jesus or not. He will keep our enemies alive and well as long as we need them. Number 10, love has to show some sympathy. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep in verse 15. Love gets involved. It doesn't stand stoically on the sidelines while others go through a hard time. Many of us probably find it easier to cry with someone else than to rejoice with them. It's a good thing when we can laugh with our friends and then cry with them later. But number 11, love has to live in harmony. Live in harmony with each other. In verse 16a, the Greek literally reads, think the same things toward each other. This doesn't imply total agreement. After all, if two people totally agree on everything, one of them is unnecessary. (laughs) The word harmony implies a beautiful symphony, a collection of instruments playing on the same page at the same time. They don't sound alike. They don't play the same notes. So it's in the body of Christ the same way. We don't all look alike or act alike or sound alike. And we certainly don't always think alike. But if you doubt that, remember the last church business meeting you attended. Or better yet, listen to the different conversations in the lobby of the church after a morning service. The church, both local and worldwide, is enriched by a variety of different options. But there is harmony amid the crazy sounds when we understand that the things that unite us are greater than the things that divide us. And number 12, love has to show humility. Don't be haughty, but associate with the lowly and never be conceited. That's what verse 16 of Romans 12 says. We can say it more directly, don't be a snob. The word translated conceited means wise in your own thinking. Don't get a big head. Don't think you are too good to hang out with people who are not in your social class. 
One translation says, make real friends with the poor. Say what you will about Jesus, but he was no snob. He associated with tax collectors and prostitutes and drunkards, and he reserved his harshest words for the Pharisees who robbed widows' homes and claimed to be serving God. Don't get me started. Jesus wasn't a front runner. He was a true friend of sinners who welcomed everyone who wanted to be with him. Someone told D.L. Moody, Sir, I'm a self-made man. To which Moody replied, You have relieved the Almighty of a great responsibility. (laughs) So as we come to the end of this episode, I can only comment that our churches would be happier if we took the passage to heart that we just read. You know, it's one thing to talk about love. It's another thing to put it into practice. A pastor who preached on love for 12 weeks in a row had a frustrated church leader come up to him. And he was so split in his mind. And he could not understand how could this pastor preach on love for 12 weeks in a row? Shouldn't we be doing something? Why are you always preaching on love? Well, you know what? Love doesn't always look the same way in every situation. And sometimes we have to practice tough love, even in how we respond to people that don't agree with us. Surely we can be misunderstood. But increasing the dosage is still God's prescription for dealing with unlovely people who challenge you. You may wonder how to apply a message like this because it covers so much territory. Well, here are some suggestions that I've been doing. I've been trying to memorize Romans 12. And I also think about praying over Romans 12, maybe one verse at a time, asking God to work these qualities into my life. Maybe even picking one or two areas where I need to grow and write down about where I can begin. And if that's too difficult, just pick one of the 12 and make it your goal to put it into practice this week. As you think and as you pray and ask the Lord to bring specific people to your mind, remember, remember that love does amazing miracles for sure. So the love of February, much more than I even thought, begins to just reach in a different part of my life. It doesn't look the same. It's easy and spiritually dangerous to be nonspecific when it comes to love, though. If we are to grow in this area, our love must reach out to specific people we meet this week. They may come to us through an email or a phone call or a chance encounter or a meeting or when we're even in a big hurry or on our way to do something important and we don't have time to be bothered. We would be glad to help them later, but they need help now. And what will we do then? That's the real test of love. Or the test may come in dealing with the same old grumpy people you live with or work with or go to school with every single day. You know, grumpy people need love. Who will do it if it's not you? The most powerful recommendation for any body of believers is this, that the members love one another. The world really just hungers for this and flocks wherever it's found. And when the unchurch are asked what they're looking for in a church, the answer is always the same. They're looking for a caring church, not just a friendly church or a relevant church or a church with plenty of programs for the kids. Not just a church where the Bible is clearly taught. As good and essential as those things are, they don't touch the deepest heart cry of this generation. They want to be loved truly and deeply. And when the people of the world find such a place, they stand in line to get in. How does God help us grow in this area? By putting us in situations that force us to practice Christian love. Over the years, I've observed God do this again and again in my own life. He allows two people to have difficulties with each other, often to the point of anger and bitterness. He does it because the only way we learn to love is by dealing with unlovely people. I've seen it happen between husbands and wives, parents and children, co-workers, neighbors, fellow students, and relatives. 
I've seen it happen between church members who couldn't stand each other. By God's grace, people who start out disliking each other often end up as dearest friends. We must be a community of love, and I owe it not only to you, but also during this podcast to always teach and to love and to serve. Let Christian sympathy go out to those in need. Let's take the banner of God's concern around the world and let's pray for one another, and especially for those with whom we disagree. Let our hearts overflow with brotherly love for all of God's children everywhere. Dear Lord Jesus, teach us to love each other as you have loved us. Amen. Well, the love boat is calling me. Anybody else love to watch reruns of that show like me? It's crazy to watch just how many stars and actors and personalities have morphed from that series. Big time actors who went on to greater things. But I've been reading that one of the reasons the show was such a hit was how they treated each other on the set. Gavin McLeod, for one, considering he was just starting out in his walk of faith, had the reputation of caring and making friends easily on the show. It's no wonder later on in his life that he became such an outspoken Christ follower and led many of Hollywood's elite to the Lord. How did that happen? By relationship, by love, and by being a friend first. This month, as we celebrate Valentine's Day, Black History Month, Groundhog Day, Play Your Ukulele Day, National Carrot Cake Day, Work Naked Day, <laughs> Farmer's Day, Ice Cream Day, Breakfast Day, National Marriage Week, Laugh and Get Rich Day, National Pizza Day, Armed Forces Day, National Shut-In Day, Abraham Lincoln's Birthday, National Football Hangover Day on the 13th, Susan B. Anthony's Birthday, and National Cabbage Day, and National Crab Stuffed Flounder Day, National Love Pet Day and President's Day and Shrove Monday and Ash Wednesday and National Chili Day and National No-Brainer Day. Whew. Let's just say it's National Love Month. And man, it starts with you and it starts with me. This ubiquitous podcast comes to you every week right here on many podcast networks around the world. And thank you again for your faithful support as well as sharing this podcast with your friends and social media sites. Get on SueDuffield.com today where you can find our site store filled with all kinds of music, CDs, and my book, Ubiquitous, A Humorous Travelogue of an Unfiltered Saint, as well as information on our virtual concerts and also on the road events. By far, I love you. Have a blessed day today, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>